I want to tell you how thrilled I am to be in Oklahoma. This is my first visit, and my friend who is a native has been taking us all around. And really, you have a rich and beautiful state, those of you who are native Oklahomans, I will tell you. And to respond to the question about grammarians, years ago, I'm maybe a little embarrassed to say, when my friend Cheryl and I used to visit bars, um, people found out we were English teachers. Cheryl always said, I'm off duty now. <laughs> so those of you who are English majors now know what to say, because people always say, oh, I went to my grandma. <laughs> I'm off duty. I used to live in a farmhouse that had a big stone porch with a tin roof, and this poem is set there. It's a poem about loss. The woman who tries to believe. Beneath the tin roof of a stone porch, a woman listens. Rain clicks on tin, creating time. Minutes in a row like garnets knotted on a sturdy thread. She believes a rose turning in its moment of near perfection does exist apart from its dead self, the mat of rotted petals like a hole stabbed by crows in the side of a dead raccoon, crows that remember and seek the dead heart. When a car passes on the gravel, their beaks return to the blood before the splashed water flattens itself. To the woman, the rain on the roof sounds like frogs, she hears, marking their need for each other, ticking awake when she is awake in the night. Most mornings, she lifts a dead frog from the pool with a rescue hook. In the night, blue light rising out of the pool charms the frogs from their muddy slough. She believes they must curl themselves in, leaping on gigantic legs, purposeful, eager, dying already. Everything ends, she knows this, but she tells herself it happens in a different blue pool, in a different, less insistent kind of rain. I'm guessing most of you have not been to church where they have those cardboard fans. Does anybody remember those? Okay, that's two. That's three. We got three of them. These fans, uh, at least when I was young, on one side there's a picture of Jesus, maybe with the little children, and on the other side, advertisement for funeral home. Did you have that? Yes. Yeah? Funeral home. Pay for this. So. This poem mentions that kind of fan. Glory. I believe in the large chair I sit in. A cardboard fan bends in my fingers, pastel Jesus and children printed on one side, ad for the funeral home on the other. On the communion table, silver instruments of the soul. Light curves back from all the shining. I'm tired of the worn red carpet that leads to the kneeling rail. God is a flower ripped from the ground, purple at the thin edge, purple at the heart. I open my eyes. I am elsewhere. I speak to you now the way God does print on a thin page. I want to believe in bread eaten by angels, children in pink robes, seas that give back their dead. Mm. Given that poem, it probably won't surprise you to hear that I used to be married to a Presbyterian minister. <laughs> uh, this is my second husband, David, is here. He objects if I say my current husband. That didn't seem quite right. Uh, he, is, he is not the man who appears in this poem. And I'm going to tell you, I told my mother this was strictly fiction. Oh, mom, people know those things didn't really happen, but I'll tell you since she's not here. 
some things somewhat similar to this happened to me. Woman howling. When the woman tells her friends she has a rich inner life, she means she goes to cheap motels in the afternoons. In her pew at church, a light seems to shine on her yellow hair. Everyone knows her, the minister's wife. She listens to the stories other people tell of other women's men and their moods. When she must walk among the congregation, her body is her disguise. She attends the day school of desire, a man with a red mustache. Others had asked her, the meter reader, sniffing her need, a high school boy with curling hair. Alone at night, she steps into a closet, closes the door. A neighbor walks nearby, his little dog nosing the bushes. The man hears the woman howling, knows it means an inner life like a box of knives. A dog in a trap who chews till he bites bone. The woman thinks of gifts her lover brought her. On the long ride home from the Elms Motel, she stopped once, put roses in a culvert under the road. Near them, a golden chain. The title of the next poem comes from a scale a British naval officer devised to categorize wind velocities. And the name of that scale is Beaufort Scale. Do you remember the day, love, when all the trees were iced with cracking glass like cold stars? Blue lights gleamed in the scattering breakage, lustrous bale fire, dark lanterns, their sliding panels ruptured. Do both of us need the beauty of excess Descants leaping high above melodies, ornaments brighter than song? Or is it precision we crave, the careful gradations of Beaufort's scale, light air, moderate breeze, whole gale? In today's thundering, flowers split to bearded stamens. Can I fail to call what I did? duplicity, or stand in the shattering while all that shined in us bursts and falls away. Mm. I've heard it claimed that we all have little narratives, and my little narrative is getting out. I got out of Iowa, <laughs> and this poem <laughs> is, you know, it's not that bad a state, but it's not Oklahoma either. So, uh, this poem is about getting out. Finding the way. I know I could live like an animal. Let knives darken in their wooden cases. Dust thicken on smeared mahogany. Dishwater clot in the cold sink. I've got my story. It's a form of getting out, a long, flat highway or a short escape, a dream in the morning before the alarm. Even a hummingbird falls asleep, slows the constant motor of her heart, lets trumpet flowers bloom in her trembling eyes. Truly gone is harder. Yet some women pick up their pocketbooks, open doors, pin red flowers in their gleaming hair. <laughs>